you are watching Herb Nerd. My name is Colleen. I am about to show you a video that is an excerpt from my course Herbal Remedies Intensive. It is a five module course that covers all the different solvents that you will be using to make advanced herbal remedies. Everything from tea to tinctures to double extracts with things like mushrooms. And it's all really great information and this is a 30 plus minute long video on how to make tea four ways. So definitely subscribe if you like what you see, check out some of my other content and enjoy. Okay, let's make some tea. So I've got everything set up here for all the different types of tea that we discuss in this week's curriculum. And we're gonna start with making a hot infusion, just really the simplest and most traditional way of making tea. So I have a few things here that I'll need. I'm going to be using a French press, which I love to use because it just helps keep the lid on top, which holds in all those volatiles, and also it helps to strain out your herbs before you pour your beverage. Um, we've got our first herb in your supply box or that we'll be discussing today, and that's our Milky Oat Tops, one of my favorite herbal tea uh, herbs. And so that's why I went with that. Just love the way it tastes, and I think you will too. And I also have this really wonderful electric kettle. So this is actually going to be able to tell me what temperature I'm shooting for. So I just turn it on. And remember on your handout, it says that the water heat or the, the temperature Fahrenheit of your hot water for a hot infusion can be anywhere from 180 degrees to 210 degrees. So I am going to set this to an even Steven 200 and let that heat up while I prepare my hot infusion. So this is going to make, you know, probably about, this looks like a, about the same size as a 32 ounce mason jar. So that's, you know, more tea than you would normally make for one cup of tea. So an eight, an eight, an eight ounce cup of tea um, would be uh, a fourth of this. So one fourth of this, uh, I'm going to roughly estimate, is a cup of tea. Just to be sure that I'm right on that, I grabbed myself a one cup measuring cup. I've got my hot water here, and eight ounces is one cup. That is one cup of tea. But you know, I generally make more than one cup at a time, so I'm going to be filling my French press, um, I'm going to be filling it halfway so that I have two cups of tea. So let's see if this one cup measurer fills this about halfway. That's one. See, that's about a quarter. And I was, so I was about right with that measurement. You can always play with these types of tests as you're figuring out your best method for making your tea at home. So as I was hoping, that worked out to be about half of my French press is two cups of water. Um, you can always add a little bit more water when you're making tea because there will be some loss. Obviously the dry herb is gonna collect some of that water that you've added. And so you won't get exactly two cups of tea out of this, you're going to get a little bit less. So you can always add a little bit more for loss. So when we're talking about adding one to three teaspoons of your dry herb to your cup of water, remember that's the ratio on your handout, one to three teaspoons of your dry herb to one cup or eight ounces of hot water. Um, okay, so that's great. And if you are really into measuring things, absolutely you can follow that guide. But I, I'm all, I'm always a fan of more is better. Uh, as long as it's a ton, especially if it's a tonic herb like Milky Oat Tops, you really can't go wrong with adding more than what is re recommended on the handout. So this is, you know, probably about three tablespoons three or four, and what's even more interesting about that is it's pretty hard to tell, because every herb is different, like, whereas, you know, some ground up dandelion root, it's going to be really easy to take a tablespoon of that and to get an exact measurement. Taking a tablespoon of this really fluffy material, the, the oak tops, <laughs> which are flying all over the table, uh, measuring a teaspoon of this is a little bit tricky, honestly, because it's just so fluffy, and you don't want it to be too weak of a tea either, you really want to taste the herb. So I uh, have, you know, if I were to tamp this down, that would be about four, four ounces of, of herb here. But I'm going to just, um, you know, I'm going to just pour the whole thing in here. Ha ha ha. 
make sure we get that all. So now the, the next thing that's an important tool to have is a chopstick. So you can make sure to get all of your herb into your water. And another great tool here is the press for the French press. It's really good at submerging the herb under the water. Always a great idea to try and get all of the herbs saturated with the water. Um, I'm going to let this sit for a few minutes and then we'll come back to it because obviously there is a steep time when it comes to making hot infusions. I usually like to wait no less than 10 minutes for a tea to infuse. Sometimes if you're working with pre-made tea bags from a company, uh, they have really ground down their herb and it, it infuses itself into the water more quickly. But when you're working with this whole plant or, or cut and sift leaf that you're gonna get from your suppliers or that you're going to make from your own dry herbs at home, you definitely need to give it more, more you definitely need to give it more of a infusion time so that it has time to um, impart its constituents to the hot water. So you can set a timer if you'd like, set a timer for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever, uh, whatever you're willing to wait to get your tea. We're actually gonna come back to this in about five minutes because I'm going to want to do one more step to make my milky oat top tea even more delicious. So we'll be back in five minutes to check on this. All right, we've let this steep for five minutes, and now, as I mentioned, we're going to be taking this a step further and trying to break down this plant material a bit. Uh, you will learn from me as we go through this course together that I am a big fan of breaking things down as much as possible. Always, always the theme of my medicine making or remedy making uh, process. So this, you know, it's beautiful, and you've got some whole milky oat tops, which uh, I think is a, a beautiful thing to look at, very picturesque, but you're not really getting in there with the water, you know, um, because of this, the plant is a bit protected from totally imbibing most of its constituents into the water, so we need to take a, a next step to make this really yummy, tasty tea. So I've got an immersion blender here, and I'm going to just keep it on low, and you're going to immersion blend this a little bit. So that makes a really yummy looking tea. You've already got more, so much more of the chlorophyll, the green chlorophyll from the oats are, are in the water now. And the water has also thickened because of these yummy starches that exist in the milky oat. So now that I've done that, I'm going to let it steep for the final 10 minutes. So we're gonna do a total of 15 minutes for this steep, press it and drink it. Um, when I make milky oats, because it's so nourishing to the nervous system, I'll, f I'll make a whole quart of it at a time. I'll sometimes even make a whole half gallon of it at a time. So I'll just get a half gallon mason jar, you know, fill it a quarter of the way up, maybe a little bit less with some fresh milky oat tops that I've just picked, um, because it's actually really fun to go out into the garden and just strip the, the milky oat tops off of the, the stalks of the milky oat. Um, bring that inside, put it into your your hot, you know, put it into your French press, pour some hot water over it, and then you're making what, you know, we've talked about as a tisane, a fresh herb hot infusion. So we're using dried here, that's what I shipped you all, and um, really you can bring alive the milky oat really beautifully by just doing this process. You've re-wet all of those constituents, and because they already really are hydrophilic, they already really love to be in water, it really does just revive the plant to bring it back to this state. So we are going to let this steep and we'll be right back to try it out. All right, so we're gonna press this and put it in a cup. Look at how yummy the color is on that. Nice and cloudy, I don't know if you can see that from your vantage point, but it's really nice and cloudy and that cloudiness means that we captured those starches. So give that a pour. Beautiful green color, a little bit left for another cup. And so, you know, I made two cups of tea, two, you know, 16 ounces, and it filled one of my big herb nerd mugs. So it's always good to make more tea than you think you're gonna need. So let's take a, take a taste. Oh, so good. This is also really wonderful with milk and honey. So a little half and half or whole milk with some honey, just really extra nourishing. 
with a flower and like many flowers that you're going to come across you can add this to a tea blend or you can make a rose flower a hot infusion on its own and it's really going to be just that easy you just pour the hot water over it and it's ready to go after you let it steep for about 10 minutes because flowers are so delicate they really impart their wonderful flavor and healing properties to the water pretty quickly. So um, we're going to fill up the French press this time with our rose petals, our rose petal hot infusion. And so again, we've got four cups to make up this French press, three teaspoons per cup at one tablespoon equal, equaling three teaspoons. So I'm gonna do four tablespoons. One, two, three and four. I'm letting my hot water, well, I'm letting my water heat up to 180 degrees. Uh, remember I gave you that range of 180 to 210. When you're working with something as, as fragile or uh, delicate as a flower, you can keep the water heat lower. So I'm going with 180 degrees for this particular preparation because you just don't need to add as much intense heat you're gonna already deal with having to put the lid on it really quick because there's a lot of volatile oils in the rose and we don't wanna lose those volatile oils to evaporation. So we need to get the lid on as quickly as possible so that all the volatile oils, which is really the flavor of rose, that's what makes a rose a rose. That's why I can smell this right now and it's just already so intoxicating, um, as you'll see from the samples that you received. And so we are at 180 degrees, excellent. So I can turn that off and pour it in. Make sure to kind of coat your roses and I'm already able to smell those volatile oils evaporating away. So this is a lovely hot water dispenser, but it sure goes slow talking about ritual and taking a breath. What a great practice. All right, we fill that up and put the lid on and let that infuse for about 10 minutes. I always like to make sure to give everything a stir with a chopstick, both at the beginning and the end. All right, we're back with our hot infusion of rose flower. Um, I think I mentioned 10 minutes, but really you only want to let roses infuse for a short time because they are so high in tannins. And tannins, as you let your infusion infuse, <laughs> are going to make it more and more astringent, which has got a dry mouth feel, which is great. I mean, roses are really wonderful at astringing or tightening or tonifying tissue. And that works both, you could use this as a facial toner or you could use it as um, a, sits bath. Um, so it's great for topical use, especially the more tannin, the more you allow the tannins to come out in the hot water. But when you're drinking a rose hot infusion tea, letting those tannins come out into the water is not as pleasant because you end up with this really drying mouthfeel. So you want to kind of keep your steeps on the, the rose hot infusion a little bit lower. I let this go a little bit too long. That's why it's so dark. So see how the roses turned white and the water turned this dark brown color. So all that rose pigmentation, which is those anthocyanins, they're all very antioxidant rich. Um, they are now imparted to the water as opposed to the petals. So I've got myself a nice hot tea of rose petals here. Definitely, oh, smells so good, tastes so good. You can... Okay, moving on to a cold infusion. Since we're already on the theme of doing infusions, let's continue on with cold water. So uh, we've already talked through a lot of this in the text and sections that led up to this video for this week's curriculum, but I just will reiterate here because I love to talk things out in person, um, that we have all these really wonderful cold water soluble constituents in herbs. And one of the ones that is most utilized for health and well-being is these cold water mucopolysaccharides. Now mucopolysaccharide is not a real word, but uh, they do have the, they are polysaccharides that love to 
um, collect water. These molecules are really good at grabbing and collecting water molecules and thickening and swelling. And so as they thicken and swell, they impart this slippery, slimy kind of feel to the water. And that's really best extracted with cold water, believe it or not. It doesn't have to be cold, cold. It can be room temperature water, but you can also store a cold infusion in the fridge. That's a great way to keep a cold infusion over time. So I'm going to make a marshmallow root cold infusion. That's probably the number number one herb uh, or root of an herb known for its cold water polysaccharide uh, constituents, really high in those yummy constituents. So I'm going to be using a mason jar for this with a lid and that's because we want this to infuse over time. Cold water infusions are really great to be done you know, overnight if you can. So think about it the night before, put your root or put your herb in your mason jar, pour the water over it and just let it sit out and forget about it. Or you if it's a hot day and you're really going for like those for that really cold, refreshing, slippery water for rehydration in the morning, then you're going to put it in the fridge and that's a great way to do it too. Um, okay, so we talked about our proportions. One to three teaspoons per cup of water room temperature or cold water in this case. So we have a 32 ounce jar here, which is four cups of water. One cup of water is eight ounces, eight times four is 32. So we have a 32 ounce jar here and we've got some marshmallow root here. Okay, so you can use a tablespoon measuring cup. See, see how I was talking about in the la for the last herb when I was talking about how fluffy the mil milky oat tops were. This is exactly what I was talking about here, how with this herb, it's cut and sift. Um, and so it's already been really processed down to this smaller, finer size. And so then it's really easy to measure out those teaspoons or tablespoons per cup of hot water. Per cup of water. <laughs> Got to wrap my head around cold infusions. Okay, so I've got a tablespoon here, equivalent to around three teaspoons. I am going to, so we're talking about four cups of water, so we can do four tablespoons of our marshmallow root. One, two, three, four. That's essentially three teaspoons per cup of water. And now we are going to pour our room temperature water over that and fill the jar. So then you put a lid on this and shake. So I've got my lovely ball jar lid here for a 32 ounce jar and give it a good shake. And you can revisit the shaking on this as you wait for it to infuse. Um, definitely, like I said, we're going to let this infuse over time, so I'm going to set this aside for now and move on to the next tea while we wait for it to infuse. Okay, so now we're going to make a decoction. And for your decoction, we are making a dandelion root decoction. And I love me some dandelion root. Um, I especially love it when it's roasted. So I sent you some raw dandelion root. It's wonderful to take as a tea, um, especially if you're going to use a French press or something that doesn't have as fine of a mesh because there's a ton of inulin in the fibers of dandelion root. And that inulin is a prebi prebiotic. It's food for your probiotics in the gut. So it helps to fortify and strengthen and nourish your healthy gut flora. So it's actually really great to go dig up some dandelion root, chop it up and cook it up in a saute or a stir fry because that's really the best way to get those that, that inulin fiber. It's, it's basically the fiber of the dandelion. So you really wanna eat the dandelion to get it. Um, but dandelion tea is just so tasty and wonderful, uh, especially the root. All right, I am ready to go with some dandelion decoction. So dandelion root, I have it here. I got it from a wonderful herb farm uh, up in Oregon up in Grants Pass, Oregon, called Oshala Farm. I have a friend who's actually their farm manager there. She's a wonderful woman, and they grow some exceptional organic herbs. And what's funny is that when I received this from them, um, talk about your organoleptics and honing your kind of skills about looking and assessing the quality of herbs, I really was shocked to see that they didn't process this very much. So there are some pretty big pieces of dandelion root in here. 
that's why it's really important to chop your dandelion root really fine before you dry it because once you dry it it gets a lot harder to break it down any further um, you can actually snap this it does it's so dry and it, it does break down pretty well so if you do want to try and get it to break down a little bit further before decocting it you can but um, it still will make a great tea as I said the quality of this dandelion root is exceptional so we're just going to go with this and see how it turns out in a tea so uh, we are going to make a decoction and uh, you know we're talking about folk method for making teas this is a great time for some folk herbalism where I am going to just pour my dandelion root into this pot that I have ready to go and you know not worry so much about how much I have but I have filled I filled the bottom of the pot essentially with a thin layer of dandelion root and then I'm going to just kind of fill this with fresh water because as you're decocting over time, you are going to lose a lot of your water content from evaporation. So you kind of start with a lot and let it cook down. And then the more you cook it down, the more concentrated the constituents will be in the leftover water. So dandelion root, again, it's a tonic herb. It's definitely a diuretic, so it will make you pee. Um, but really nourishing to the gut and uh, fortifying to the liver. And so it's really something that you can just be drinking throughout the day as long as you're close to a bathroom and um, and enjoying just for this. It's a great, you know, alternative to drinking coffee, especially if you roast it first. So I'm making a lot just so that I can kind of have it on hand throughout the day. Um, so again, the ratio is still the same if you did want to stick to um, your ratio or if you did want to stick to your measurements that we've talked about it's still one to three teaspoons per cup of water um, so so if you want to stick to that great it kind of helps you to conceptualize yeah, yes did I in fact um, keep my dosage safe but we're working with all of these tonic herbs in this course so you're really not as worried about overdosing on these herbs because um, I mean, everything in moderation. You don't need to be drinking pots and pots of dandelion root every single day of your life. Um, it's good to switch these things up over time. So as long as you're just kind of following that. All right, so you start by turning on your hot water onto high so that you can get it boiling. You wanna boil it first, really just bring it to a boil. You don't need to start boiling it like crazy. You just wanna bring the water to a boil and then reduce it to a simmer and then once you reduce it to a simmer, you let it simmer for a while. You know, anywhere, if you've got an hour to kill, awesome. Simmering simmering for an hour will be great. I just really recommend that everybody's stovetop is different. Simmering for one person can be at a higher temperature than simmering for someone else. Try to really put it on the lowest setting you can while it's still simmering because you will, especially if you're leaving it for hours at a time, you will, you will definitely reduce your water content and you could even reduce it all the way to nothing if you're not careful. I have done this in the past. You don't want to end up with a bunch of root uh, burning in the bottom of your pot because you've because you've simmered off all of your all of your good tea. Um, okay, so again, it's a waiting game. Now we've set this up, we're decocting. I'll let you know when it starts to boil and then we'll reduce it to a simmer. But at this point, we're just kind of letting this tea, let, letting this tea cook. Okay, look at that. They got some steam rising here. Our, we have brought our decoction to a boil, but I'm gonna take it off the heat at this point, because I don't want it to overboil. I want to let this hot plate kind of cool down so that when I put it back on here, it just goes to simmer. Um, overboiling your water kind of makes the water less vibrant, less vital. So that's just kind of the goal with that. So I'm going to pull that off for the moment and let it return to the hot plate once the hot plate has cooled down a little bit. All right, we've got a nice simmer going here with our dandelion root. We're going to let that simmer for, you know, about 30 minutes to an hour and then check out how it's looking. Here it is, the moment of truth. We have been waiting a long time for our dandelion decoction to simmer. It smells really good in this room, just tells me that the dandelion is just ready to go. It smells so wonderful and really good quality fresh dandelion. I believe this was grown last season, so it's really as fresh as you can get it from commerce. So I'm going to turn that off and I have a little strainer here so I'm gonna just honestly let this continue to steep without the heat as I drink the first cup 
Obviously this isn't going to be ready to drink right away because I just took it off the heat, so it's very, very hot. So we're going to let that cool before we enjoy it. Another one of those herbs um, that's a great, well, I already mentioned this, it's a really great substitute for coffee. And it even has, and this isn't even a roasted dandelion root, this is just raw dandelion root dried. And I already can't see the bottom of the cup. It's nice and dark and brown. Through the process of decocting roots, you soften them because that hot water slowly uh, helps bring, that hot water slowly softens the herb. And as it's doing that and cooking the herb, the hot water seeps deeper and deeper inside that hard center part of the dried root. To, to the point where it finally gets all the way through to the end. So now you actually have, uh, once you've decocted this for an hour, you have a really lovely soft roast, uh, you have a really lovely soft dandelion root that you could actually munch on to get those healthy inulin fibers into your digestive tract. Or you could add it to some sort of stir fry type thing. A really great option here would be to add it to some shaved um, burdock root and do like a Japanese gobo salad. Um, really great for the inulin content and for feeding those probiotics and healthy gut flora. Hot dandelion root tea to your health. So now we are going to move on to a tisane, the last of our herbal remedies. So a tisane is a fresh herb hot infusion. And I went out to my garden and I collected some fun herbs that we will be adding to this. Okay, so number one that I'm really excited about is that the lilacs are in bloom right now. So I'm going to be, uh, the, the stalk is a little bit woody, so I'm just going to be kind of separating the flowers off and they come off really easily actually i'm gonna have no stems in there so i'm adding lilac flowers i'm plucking each individual flower off of the stem and adding that first Okay, so we've got all of our lilac blossoms in there. And I also went out and found some lemon balm leaf. Super uplifting, joyous herb. It's considered a nervine, but it's not really tiring. It's, it's not stimulating either. It's just a really healthy, happy herb. Brings you up uh, to a pleasant state of awareness and gratitude. And then I found some cleavers and maybe you know these as a garden weed but they're a little bit wilted already but cleavers will stick to you cleave they have these tiny little hooks all over them that make them a really great gardening weed um, but they're also a really great springtime tonic herb because they're so high in minerals so i'm going to break that up and put it in there they're also considered lymphatic so they're helping kind of as we move out of the winter time, they're one of our first springtime herbs that start to pop up everywhere. It's a great opportunity to utilize those fresh spring greens to get yourself some yummy minerals that you maybe are depleted in since um, you've been hibernating all winter. And um, also help to move. Movement is key in the spring because we've also been a little bit sedentary during the winter months. So using these kind of lymphatic herbs like uh, cleavers to help move the lymph, getting your lymph moving again. And so then we have some dandelion flower. I'm gonna actually pull the petals out and just do the petals. I was actually playing with my daughter yesterday and I had some dandelion flowers in my mouth and the sequel right here is actually quite bitter. So we're gonna skip that. Just do the flowers of the dandelion petal or the petals of the dandelion flower some of these are already going to seed, you can see, because they're getting all furry inside there. That's fun. And then I do actually have a little bit of dandelion leaf, that dent de leon, the, the lion's tooth. Nice toothed edge there on the leaf, serrated edge. And um, that will be bitter, which is really good for waking up the digestion. And finally, I have some fennel leaf. I'm not going to put a ton in there, but all my fennel is starting to come up this time of year. And so, you know, I'm just processing these by tearing them apart a little bit with my hands. And now it is time to add some hot water to my tisane. So I'm gonna turn this on and get my hot water going. All right, we've got our hot water ready to go for our tisane. 
And so time to pour that over. This is a heat resistant glass pitcher. Make sure that you take that into account when you're picking your tools for making all your teas. Uh, another great vessel because it does have a little bit of a uh, strainer in the lid and it has a lid so I can hold in all those volatile constituents again. So we'll lid that, let it swish around in there. And let that infuse. This has been going for a little while now. All of our wonderful fresh herbs from the garden. Lilac and lemon balm and dandelion flower and leaf and fennel. And it smells really, really good. And this has its own little strainer built in, so I'm just going to pour from there. It's fun because you still get some of the plant bits into your tea. If you wanted your tisane to get even stronger, you could always use an immersion blender on that as well because this is all whole plant and so I haven't broken it down anymore so it's not necessarily getting as much of the, um, you know, the constituents that are tied up in the fibers of that plant. But it still makes a beautiful tea, beautiful to look at and beautiful to drink. All right, wow, costume change. So I am back and it's actually been quite a while since I started this marshmallow root infusion, cold infusion, and I wanted to come check it out. It's been 24 hours and that is perfectly fine with a cold infusion. The longer you infuse it, the better. Well, not the longer you infuse it. After a certain point, it's fully saturated with those mucopolysaccharide constituents and so you're pretty much ready to go. But I just circumstances being as they are. I let this sit for 24 hours and so a lot has happened since I last saw you and here we are to drink some marshmallow root cold infusion tea. I just wanted to show you first off how fun and beautiful this is when you do go to to shake it you can really see the kind of suspended animation of the marshmallow root here because it's thickened this water and so it does this beautiful kind of ballet of all the different cut sift, sift roots dancing together and kind of pushing off of each other in here. Um, as these polysaccharide molecules are swelling and holding on to water molecules, they're kind of bumping up against each other and making this beautiful dance. So we'll strain that and drink it. The color looks really good. The thing about cold infusions, as I mentioned earlier, is that you can also leave them in the fridge. It's a great place to store them. I just always recommend that you are sure to drink it each batch at a time. So you can leave it in your fridge for a couple of days. Teas, you know, one of the unfortunate things about using water as a solvent is that it is perishable, much more perishable than any of the other solvents we'll be talking about in this course. So wonderful for making teas and nourishing the body, but definitely have a much shorter shelf life. So the beauty of a cold infusion is that you can Fill up your jar with your herb, put it in the refrigerator, and you know drink it for the for the next few days. Uh, so the great thing about that too is after you've drunk it all the way down and you've removed all the water from the tea, you can actually refill it because a lot of these mucilaginous herbs can be reused over and over again. They'll you know make a less strong tea each time, but you definitely can reuse them. So yeah, let's take a look at how this looks when you strain it. So one thing you really want to watch for when you're straining your marshmallow root cold infusion or any mucilaginous herb is that slippery, slimy kind of looking water. So spilling as usual. Yeah, the strainer is a little bit more of a, you know, open mesh and so definitely got some of the smaller particles of marshmallow in here and you can't really tell from the video I would imagine so I definitely recommend you doing this experiment at home for yourself. But you can definitely taste the thickness. Sometimes I'll make such a thick batch of marshmallow root tea that you can really see kind of how slimy and thick the water is that's coming out of there. That might not be as pleasant for you to drink uh, if you're a texture person, but this is a great batch of marshmallow root tea. You know that it's nice and strong when it's got that beautiful color to it, you know, imparting more than just the mucilage to the water, but also tinting the water with the roots, other constituents. 
and yeah, definitely you can you can taste that mouth feel as you're drinking your marshmallow root tea throughout the day. It's just so nice and hydrating as it's going down because it's got that thick water feel that's going to really coat all the tissues of the body and help to kind of hold and retain moisture on all those tissues that it passes along the digestive tract. So to your health and happy tea making and tea drinking.